السلام عليكم ورحمة الله يا محمد كيف حالك؟ وعليكم السلام الحمد لله الحمد لله لباس لباس كل شيء لباس الحمد لله Should we do the whole podcast in Arabic? Or whatever or whatever this messy excuse of Arabic I have is Well, I don't know, bro. You're pretty shy with the Arabic, even though I actually think you're better than me. But you haven't actually proven that to me yet. But I just feel it. Oh, is it because of that encounter we had last episode? What, you think that showed you up or it showed you down? I don't know. You have to tell <laughs> <Sure>. me. <laughs> no, you're like, like yeah. <laughs> Should we tell them what happened? Go on, you tell them. You're the one who... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so last episode, episode 42, we were... In London, we were, going, we were just outside a studio where we were going to record with the guys, uh, Inspire Entertainment guys, yeah? So I come outside to look for Muhammad because he didn't know exactly which building it was. And uh, across a very small street, across the road, this guy calls me over, right? So I'm looking for Muhammad, and this guy calls me over. I'm like, oh, whatever, okay. So I go to him. And by the way, I wouldn't usually go, but he's like, he shouts across the street. <laughs> he's like, oh, no. he's like... Oh, and to Arabi. I was <laughs> right, like, yeah, all right. right. <laughs> I was like, yeah. And then he's like, okay, come. <laughs> okay. So, so I go across and then he's just like asking me, oh, you, you're, where are you from? This and that, this and that. And then basically he told me, you know, he needed help, any help I can give him. He needs, uh, he doesn't have a job. He, he actually wanted a job. Uh, he actually offered me a coffee as well, even though he had one little coffee in his hand. He's like, do you want coffee? Yeah. <laughs> Mashallah. So, so I'm I'm looking for Muhammad, and this guy's talking to me, asking me if I, you know, I've got a job for him, even though I don't even live in London. And then, and then Muhammad comes, and then we kind of have this three-way encounter. I kind of deflected to you. I was like, oh, because the guy was Moroccan, yeah. I, I was like, oh, oh was he? he's Moroccan. <laughs> oh, so I pushed it onto you. <laughs> I but he was I think, Algerian, but, bro. oh, really? No. Yeah. He's from, uh, I think he said Agadir. Oh, so, right. yeah. I was like, that's not my area. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot, a lot of stuff like that. Whenever I'm around East London Mosque, um, mm. there's a lot of people sort of hanging around asking for help or money. or Yeah, um, I think it's because, obviously, a lot of Muslims in the area, so they feel like, obviously, they're going to get more help from Muslims and non-Muslims. And mm. also, the masjid itself is quite is like quite a big building where you can, you know, you could sit inside if it's cold, and this kind of stuff. I mean, I when I was there, I had I haven't been there uh, since I left the UAE, like probably three, probably three and a half years. But I went there uh, just, just I was just like, uh, what was it? I was waiting for someone, just like reading Quran, and uh, there's a lot of people sleeping in there, man. I was surprised that they didn't like ban it, but oh, right, seems yeah. quite. Um, pro- obviously, you can't sleep overnight, but bro, you know, you know those. Um, uh, those Quran uh, holders thing, things, those wooden things that kind of fold out and you put your mushaf on it. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bro, there's a guy sleeping using that as a pillow. Oh, that's <laughs> not the first time I've seen that. Yeah, I've seen people use it. It's so uncomfortable. I'm thinking, yo, <laughs> getting comfortable, yeah? <laughs> oh, man, it's a different kettle of fish there, man. Like whenever I go there, I just feel like I'm in a different country. It's yeah. really strange. Yeah, yeah. London is sick, though. I, I like London. Um... I, I, um, East London Mosque is like it is like a beacon isn't it it's like so many people so much going on around there mm. alhamdulillah very good like imagine if there were like for example in in Brighton there was an area like that in all the major cities there was an area where it's like fully Muslim but not just Muslim but like in, in East London Mosque area you can see um, Muslim businesses um, doing well doing lots of business um, there's there's lessons going on in the masjid. There's activities. There's mm. you know the, there's a gym there, like uh, which is part of the masjid. There's a gym uh, which is se- segregated, and uh, there's Maryam Center, which has I don't know has all the women's stuff in it. Uh, women's yeah. uh, events go on in there, and they then do the, um, you have a few circumcision, s- don't they? The clinic. Next oh door. yeah, yeah. They have a um, a place that cleaning uh, the dead body as well. And they have schools. I know they have a, more than one school in, in the ELM building. Right. So it's quite sick, man. MashaAllah. Masha yeah, Allah. I mean, think of the, the leadership it would have taken earlier generations to sort of establish all of that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think no we doubt. neglect that. We fail to see. I think, you know, a lot of us fall into a habit of thinking that um, maybe the older generations haven't really done much 
here for mm. Dean and there's a lot of stuff lacking but to be honest you see something like that and you think wow that's that's an incredible achievement yeah they set the foundation I suppose and uh, the stuff like I think uh, probably it's Dhuhr Asr maybe Maghrib they do a then out loud uh, oh there. right so uh, so yeah man lots of uh, lots of unique stuff over there really yeah. Alhamdulillah it's literally uh, like um, what was it I was so after we did record, I had to drop um, Muhammad off mm-hmm. to, uh, I don't know, a station, but it was like past the, the congestion charge zone, so I had to take him as close as possible, mm. thinking that, oh, it's quite far, but it was literally mm. five minutes, well, not even, less than that, like it yeah. was literally a stone throw away, um, uh-huh. and then you were suddenly in this built-up central area of London, which yeah. which felt really strange to me. I, this is another thing, like, I suppose... I'm used to um, quite distinctive transitions in you know down south because between towns there's fields you know mm, so you you're mm. going cro- across the countryside to get to the next town whilst London it seems to just seamlessly blend into the next area and you don't really recognize that you've ch- you know yeah. it's a, it always comes across to me as a surprise like, oh I'm in a new area now I hadn't even realized oh um, okay yeah yeah and how well, vastly like different like the, yeah how vastly different the demographic is in each area um yeah. But yeah, it's, it's just a different. Yeah, kind bro, of that, that area. You know, you know that where you dropped him off, yeah. Because I know yeah. that area. I used to live there. By the way, I lived there for one year. Um, right oh, behind right. the masjid. So right, yeah. That was very good. Um, so that area, yeah. You know, all those skyscrapers you see, they weren't there when I was there. So just like oh, five wow. years ago, maybe five, six years ago, there was probably one out of those. There's probably maybe eight now. Nine, ten—I right. don't know. There was only one, or something like that. So it was only—it's only recently that this that place has been built up. And you know where East London Mosque is—is is prime real estate, man. It's like very expensive okay. over there now, because you know bank, which is like the, you know, kind of a financial kind of center of London, yep. and yep. Um, all those fancy offices over there. That area is is pretty much what you were near where you were dropping him off. So that mm-hmm. area is just growing outwards because it, they need more space, I suppose. And it's growing towards the East London Mosque area. So I, actually, I was thinking this when I was there. I was thinking, I hope these the, these Muslims who are like have shops or restaurants or whatever around there, I hope they own that property because otherwise they're going to get forced out with the prices. Yeah, man. it's going to be gone, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, the East London Mosque, obviously, it's, it's owned. So that's good, alhamdulillah. But if the people don't own the houses there, then... Uh, then they'll have to move, and then who's going to go to the masjid? So, it's uh, economics. Uh, I don't know what you call that. Is that economics? Economics class, right there. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh God, I don't know how. I, I don't know if I'd be able to live there, man. I didn't realize how close. Um, so, like, there's different organizations, Muslim organizations that I've always heard of, but mm-hmm. um, it hadn't dawned upon me how close to each other they were. You know, they were all a lot of them were all on one street. You mean <laughs> physically the. Yeah, like the, the physical yeah, the locations office. of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you've got. But um, at the same time, it's um, mm. uh, there's that whole illusion of grandeur kind of thing where, you know, uh, I think through marketing, mm. uh, a lot of organisations really show that they're quite big and established and this and that. Right. Um, and then when you do see them in reality, it's not as um, <laughs> big and established yeah. as you think. But there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, wrong with yeah, that. Yeah. I think this it just shows that they, yeah they are displaying professionalism despite the lack of I oh. don't know size and resources they actually yeah, have. Yeah. But I mean the power behind all of these any given organization is mostly going to be in the people. You know mm. the the work that the people put in. Mashallah. You know. Mm. So, but yeah, it's got what have, what have you got? You've got Huda TV where we were in those studios. You've got MRDF. You've got Ibrahim College. You've got Muslim Aid. They used to have an office in the same building we were in, I think, but I, I, I'm not sure if they're still there. Yeah. National Zakir Foundation is right there, isn't it? So yeah, it is. It's all it's all the people, though, man. It's all the people. Everybody's there, man. Yeah. Not to mention all the classes and stuff that are getting done. Um, yeah, yeah. But in so. general, like it's just I feel for the people in London, man. The, the, having to travel from one area to another it, it mm. takes as long as me traveling to london from here um, yeah i, I always true, spend bro. so much money on fuel when i'm there because um you know everybody that i want to see or have to meet up with is just spread out east right. you know south northwest yeah, yeah, yeah. and i'm just yeah. all over the place thinking yeah. that 
I would say, oh yeah, it's fine. I'll come and see you. Thinking that it's going to be, you know, a ten minute drive or twenty mm. minute drive maximum. It ends yeah. up taking me over an hour. Sometimes it's awful. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, oh. maybe you can use the tube. You know when uh, you recorded the that podcast with uh, is his name Nord, yeah? Yes, brother. Yeah, Nord. where was? Let me guess. Yeah, that was in West London. That was in South. Oh, I think. okay. Yeah, okay. it was quite far south. I think just past Brixton. Okay. Um, it's it's actually much closer to me, so even if I was to go there, I, I think it'd take me an hour. Right. Uh, but um, yeah, if you guys haven't checked that out, I think it was a really good episode. Um, it's the first one I've done like on camera. Mm. Um, it was quite beneficial. I think we. I think uh, it just took me by surprise a little bit, like having to do it on camera because it's been so long since I've done anything like that. Right. Uh, but I do see the benefit in it, and even doing it with you. I mean, like being in person and doing it there's a lot mm. more benefits yeah um, i was wondering how it was going to be like would it be better would it be the same i would say it was better like maybe 20 percent better mm, like if sure. we if we did it regularly face to face yeah it would be it would be a vibe it would be a vibe <laughs> <laughs> definitely yeah, yeah. definitely do you know what bro on a little yeah. tangent oh. i was uh listening to a sample of an audiobook earlier and I thought, okay. oh, I'll show my wife this little sample, bro. It didn't dawn upon me until she said how this narrator sounds exactly like you. <laughs> okay. I'm going to play a clip right. into the microphone. Here we go. Okay. Let me hear. When there were so many visible woes in the world, my despair intensified. So I decided to do something. A little bit. <laughs> I disconnected. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I this chose not sounds, to look at social media. It's for like a few if days. I was black. <laughs> it's a book called uh, Notes on a Nervous Planet. I think it's meant to deal a lot with anxiety and, and okay. um, mental health and stuff like that. Mm. God, I, I keep finding books, bro. Um, I'm yeah. listening to um, Ego is the Enemy at the moment. Okay, um, yeah. Which I'm finding really beneficial. Um, yeah. I think because it's one of those books that slots in quite naturally to our state of mind and our values anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Naturally, we're told, you know, like, the, the the detrimental effects of arrogance how yeah. uh, you know an atom's worth of pride is detrimental to our akhira mm -hmm. um so when i started listening to it he, the the author was sort of uh, discussing almost like it was news as if it was like oh by the way ego is bad <laughs> yeah um and i was like well yeah and yeah. then i realized well actually naturally in the masses that's not considered a normative uh, mm. approach actually uh, ego, yeah i remember yeah, when all, i was listening to the book the same thing is like, yeah, like it's new. Yeah. Do you have you heard it before then? Yeah, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Uh, what did you think of it? I thought it was very good, man. Uh, but the, you know, I don't know about you, but with me, um, I'm a very visual person. So if mm. I listen to a book, I don't tend to retain too much. But when I was right. listening to it, I was loving it quite a lot. Like I love how he he he's teaching you stuff, not lecture style, but story style. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Definitely. Definitely. And I think for me, um, although I'd love to be able to sit and read, if I'm seen sitting down, bro, and my mm. son comes and sees me, it's oh, over. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've got to keep it moving. You know, the um, classic the classic uh, trick is to go and sit in the car <laughs> to be alone. Oh, for real. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. I had another one on my wish list, but I can't. Mm seem to oh it was called atomic habits or something along those lines oh yeah yeah have you heard james of that clear one? yeah have yeah, you read it i have not uh, but i've been on his mailing list for probably a year and he mm. he regularly writes like articles and stuff around uh behavior change and mm. uh so based on that i can recommend the book i also um just a couple of weeks ago i re i listened to an interview of his because obviously he's going around promoting the book because it just came out kind of recently yeah. i listened to an interview of his um podcast uh london real podcast um with him with james clear and it was a very very good podcast like solid like no fluff kind of podcast i think mm -hmm. it, was, it was actually two and a half hours long potentially so um I, I, yeah, I would recommend the book for sure, man. But if you just want a flavor first, then maybe listen to the podcast. Do you um, do you find yourself actually practically implementing the the sort of theories and and, and um, methodologies that you come across in these books? Mm. I, I, 
You know, I can't say, like, probably I only implement, who knows, maybe uh, 20%, uh, but but I do. And I think that's the difference between uh, people that end up resenting these kind of books and people that uh, are just, literally, bro, some people, it's like an addiction. I know people, personally, who will read book after book after book about how to improve themselves. Hmm. And th- basically, they see the book as telling them how bad they are, Right. And right. and then they're like, oh, I'm bad, I'm terrible, I'm not doing these things. But then they'll put the book aside, get another one, and they'll be like, oh, you know, I'm rubbish. And then they'll get another one. And so it's a very bad cycle, man. But but if you implement just, again, I actually did a video just yesterday about um, how to read personal development books. And one of the points I made was you've got to be curious when you're reading the book don't be judgmental Mm. right so just just like take it in while you're reading it then when you finish you can decide okay i'm gonna do this or i'm gonna take that part because it Mm. seems to it seems to like i'm convinced of it but it seems to work kind of thing it seems like it would fit into my life and i think that's why i do sira masters bro because because um over the years i have implemented stuff so i have something to say about it you know And, it's uh, kind of um, yeah. cathartic in a way. That is one thing that when I was listening to Ego is the Enemy, um, how poignant it was when he spoke about <coughs> our um, our constant desire to express these ideas. So right. we feel like we when we talk about them a lot, so uh-huh. I don't know, it could be on social media or whatever, we feel like we're making progress just by talking. Mm. You know, so we're talking about the issue. So, for example, and I do this a lot on the podcast. I realized it where I'm talking a lot about, you know, maybe self development or improving this aspect of my life, improving that. And I talk and I talk and I talk and I talk. But then when you we- measure the talk with the actual action, it's very little because I've, mm. co- but I've convinced myself and I'm so happy about what I've been saying that I've convinced yeah. myself subconsciously mm. that I'm actually making progress and taking action just by talking. Mm. No, yeah, subhanallah. So like, uh, it makes me think of like uh, uh, the same like protesting or like venting on social media about injustices. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like it's the exact same effect. Mm, Not definitely. that, obvi- honestly, man. It's like you can't fully put down that kind of stuff. Like you know, they always say like, if I was to go back onto Twitter, I would be beefing with all these people that do that. Yeah, but what yeah. they would say is, I'm raising awareness, right? And that's fair enough. But like you said, if it makes you feel like you've done something just by talking, then I think you're you're being misled there. Yeah, you know? but that's the thing. Okay, hypothetically, mm. everybody's aware. Let's say everyone's aware. Yeah. You've done your job, right? Yeah. It doesn't change anything. Nothing's yeah. changed. Now everyone's aware, but no one's yeah. done anything yeah. about it. Exactly, bro. And the minimum you can do, even though it's probably the most powerful thing, but the minimum in terms of time and, and effort is to make du'a. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I don't know really out of all the tweets we read of raising awareness how many out of those times we see that are we going to stop and make dua i don't really know i i like to i like when people raise awareness regarding a charity that is helping the cause yeah i think that's always brilliant it's more like action based isn't it? it's like okay mm. give to this thing um but i don't want to bash right raising awareness because i realize obviously it's absolutely essential but it's just like don't make that your full-time thing and that's what a lot of people are doing and especially mm. Social media has enabled people to feel like like raising awareness is doing. It's like fully doing. Like I'm doing everything I can just by like tweeting. Like, come mm. on, man. Mm. I've uh, I think I've started well at least this year of my life shying away a lot from commenting on on the public issues mm. um, because I mentioned this to a brother the other day where he was talking about. Um, his difficulty in in um, putting off music, mm. so he he struggles with. I think because oh yeah, that's what it was. So I I shared an excerpt of the book I was listening to. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I said again, uh, ego is the enemy, and he mentioned something which I've always thought about for a very long time, uh, but no one never really put it into words. And he said how we put on our headphones mm-hmm. and we walk down the street listening to. I don't know our favorite soundtrack convincing mm. ourselves that we're essentially like the main character of a, of a film right mm-hmm. uh, and and loading ourselves with this self-importance I think I mentioned this mm. to you before didn't I mm. um, and um, because of that um, 
we block out basically the world and we don't engage with the world very much and we give ourselves this false sense of confidence which doesn't really exist because the moment you unplug that sort of uh, influence mm. you're quite lost mm. quite anxious and actually the reality hits you that you're not this main character mm. in fact you're you know you're probably an extra in this film mm. there are main characters out there but you're not one of them so don't yeah. fool yourself yeah. um and anyway, so I, I put that up, and the brother messaged me saying, "Oh, you know, he, I don't know why he told me, um, but he was like, oh, you know, I'm really struggling with it.'" And I knew that he was sort of listening to music based on so, some of the posts that he's putting up and stuff. Anyway, <laughs> but what I will say is the brother's really good, really practicing, uh, always vocal about uh, injustices in the world and issues and stuff. And I, I, I don't know. I, instead of telling him music is haram or uh you know here's how to stop doing it i've always said to myself when it comes to any sin is like those injustices that we're vocal about don't you hold yourself accountable for them you know and it's not a concept that many people think of but we are the state of the ummah you know we are part of the state of the ummah right um Mm. and as as the last part of tal that says you know that people do not uh, people do not change unless they change themselves essentially right um so as dark as it sounds when i think of you know the most grievous injustices in the world of our muslim sisters getting harmed in such and such prison or you know such and such country Mm. um look in the mirror and 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 see that the ummah is you and you are the ummah and if your state is that bad that maybe there is a part of the ummah that changes if you change Um, of course i know it sounds so far detached for a lot of people uh and and it reminds me of issues that we've spoken about before in, in mind heist where we speak about you know the, the the enthusiasm for for people going out to protest um mm. and then they've done that they they get their euphoria from that and mm. then they just carry on living their lives as normal there's no connection between the state of the ummah and the state of themselves mm. you know yeah that's true that but this is the thing bro this is a very uh, as far as i know it's a very islamic concept that your state as an individual affects the people around you and people beyond you, you know, people mm-hmm. much far, further away from you. Um, and the only way I think you would come to that conclusion is uh, by gaining Islamic knowledge, I think, because that's mm-hmm. at least that's how I kind of did it. Like, mm-hmm. I think I went, I went between two extremes. So before I was like, it's all oppressors fault. It's not the people's fault, you know, the quote unquote people. Mm-hmm. It, it's all of that, right? Um, then I went the other way which is like it's only the people's fault and it's like evil people are evil they're gonna be evil like what can you do about that so therefore it's like the people should just change like we should all change ourselves and and improve ourselves and now I'm a little bit moving a bit more towards what I think is the middle which is like okay the oppressors are evil and we have responsibility to do what we can to stop that evil and at the same time, each day we have to wake up holding ourselves accountable for how much we're contributing to the evil. Yeah, definitely. So definitely, I think um, as dark as it sounds, <laughs> these organisations, uh, so leadership in general, so whether it's government or authority figures, um, because I've had a glimpse at that side of the world now, uh, I've realised how human those organisations are. They're not as monolithic as I used to sort of assume mm. so it's allowed me to think that even governments bro governments are made up of individuals and those individuals have lives and, yes. and, and beliefs and feelings and challenges um that manifest collectively into what the you know the actual authoritarian display is mm-hmm. uh, and we fail to negate we fail to realize that we we, <laughs> we assume that these organizations that dominate us are you know, well-oiled machines, right? That know exactly what they're doing, mm, uh, yeah, and a lot absolutely. of that comes from. You know, I don't think I'm going to shy away from saying it. It comes from conspiracy theories a lot. I remember growing up and listening to a lot of conspiracy theories about, mm. yeah, maybe it was the Illuminati, for example, or yeah. you know, um, well, let's say hypothetically the Illuminati exists and there's this new world order, and and you know they've got a well-oiled machine. They know exactly what they're doing. Mm. But they still stub their toe on the end of a table and really hurt themselves. <laughs> and probably yeah. hop around. Do you understand? Like, yeah. they're still human and yeah. they still have these challenges. And, yeah. you know, maybe they still suffer from mental health issues or mm. maybe they still suffer from, uh, you know, poverty or somebody dying. And they feel they're not these cold hearted <laughs> lizard mm. monsters, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Which, yeah. Um, <laughs> 
which which le- leads you to this notion that we are all part of this human condition, especially the Muslim Ummah. We are all responsible, whether from up high to down low, we all reflect it. Like um, it reminds me a lot of the that hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in regards to when when he um, he saw his Ummah essentially in front of him, you know. Mm-hmm. And it was just, it was one huge group. It mm. wasn't like they were sectioned off, or like these are the people up here, part of my ummah, but they're unaccountable, or they have a responsibility over all of these lot. So we do not judge all of these lot, we judge the top, you know, 1% or whatever. Mm. Um, and what, what's, what's, what's easier? Is it easier to, to shout and scream about, you know, those that are, you know, have authority over us, or is it easier to, to challenge ourselves and to change ourselves and a lot of people yeah. pick the former rather than the yeah. latter i suppose yeah, yeah yeah you know something coming to mind is that you know as someone who honestly bro hardly hardly affected by oppression it's easy to say this stuff um mm-hmm. like to always um blame myself and blame the general body of the ummah and say you know mm. we have to focus on ourselves but i guess I mean, look, man, like my my close family has been deeply affected by bad decisions that are top down decisions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if I was in their position, I probably would think differently, even if it's not the right thing to do. It's like I'm, I can just understand why you would go down the route of blaming everything on one person or one group of small group of people, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's like. It's like oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. know the truth, like know the reality that, you know, they've got they've got some responsibility. We've got some responsibility. Know that truth, but then also empathize with other people. Mm. Uh, that's maybe sometimes missing because, man, it's honestly what I find. It's always the people who are always saying, um, you know, it's us, it's our sins and like going all the way in that direction. You know, yeah. um, it's the people who are comfortable, you know, so. I I kind of that kind of I can't stop that voice in my head from coming. Yeah, and kind no, of saying I hear that. you. Yeah, yeah and you're right. Like you know, maybe I am being a bit of an armchair critic. Um, it is difficult. Like at the moment, recently, um, Tunisia passed a law about the niqab, which I think some people have heard about regarding where no one's allowed to wear the niqab in public institutions. Right. Um, which on face value people consider that as okay no government buildings no you know but in practice that just extends everywhere you know mm, that's what yeah, happens yeah. in practice and it's um, kind of like uh, the schools in france like you're not allowed to wear a scarf in school so you're just less likely to wear it at all yeah yeah um and it's sort of uh it's put me in a bit of a dilemma really because um you know, I was already having issues whenever I go over there, mm-hmm. and now obviously, as we all know, my wife wears niqab. So, and a, an, a, an airport itself is a public institution to some extent. So, mm. how do I even go over there? You know, mm. um, and uh, Allahu alam, like I don't know what the powers are that, that play these games in terms of the attacks that happen, and I don't know if it's just maybe what what we mentioned earlier like way too way too uh, far in one side of the extreme where it's just like um ruthless action with no wisdom behind it you know and this is or if it is you know if you want to go down the conspiracy route but low and we only judge by what's apparent mm. um mm. but then you know that so that's one of the <coughs> only things i'd say that's affecting me top down at the moment um, mm. but i don't know how i'm going to deal with it you know um I know that <laughs> raising awareness and protesting about it is only going to make the situation worse for myself and my family. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to compromise the values that I hold. Um, yeah. So when you're put in that position, all you can do is make dua and, and, and mm. do your best. Um, yeah. Yeah, see, th- this is real life, bro. Like, maybe it's not such a difficulty because you're not even living there. True. But that's real life, isn't it? It's like... Oh, there's people it, there. It, yeah, it's like you're... you're kind of uh, if you want to go there you're being forced to compromise mm. in you I think, know, potentially but I, uh yeah go on no it's just i think as we've already mentioned many times how my link there is very strong in the sense that i feel like at any moment i could just i have i'd have to pick up and go like i think that's the reality um yeah <laughs> i think it's just adding more fear to my heart now because if i was to pick up and go 
Mm. But you know, in all honesty, there is, you know, the dean isn't always um, isn't always. I don't want to say black and white. I don't like saying the dean isn't black and white. Um, but there are contingencies, I suppose, for certain situations that you you face, right? Mm. Um, and there are things that you can leverage if you really have no choice. Um, that, I think that goes with anything. I think it's it's good to to ask balanced ulama <coughs> regarding certain issues that you are realistically mm. facing. Mm. Um, so does she you know, consider the niqab to be fard? I think... I'll have to ask again. But mm. I think she considers it um, highly recommended. Mm. But she won't take it off regardless, you know. Mm. So... I don't know though I'm not 100% sure I'm not 100% sure but I think that's what she recently said mm. um, but either way like I think we've we've been so uh, as I mentioned actually in the Strong Believers podcast with Noor we are so sort of hell bent on not letting go of these symbols um, like I mentioned previously bro when I um, was in Tunisia and my <laughs> the two father figures so my father-in-law and my actual father sat in front of me just mm. grilling me bro grilling me about my beard uh, <laughs> uh, telling me to get rid of it otherwise I'm not going to get employed because this was between me graduating uni and trying right. to find like a career and yeah. grilling me grilling me grilling me and I was so emotionally distressed because of it mm. um, yeah. but I stuck to my guns in the very organization that they thought there's no way you're going to get into it yeah. with this yeah. is exactly where I went and flourished mm. um, and I and and I'd even argue I I went to and flourished because of the beard because how different I was because they mm. were so hungry for diversity mm. um and now it's like oh there's no words about that and they never talk <laughs> about that or never bring <laughs> up that past sort of uh, <laughs> discussion um but you see that for me was like a really big milestone uh, I felt like, wow, I actually did it. You know, I actually, mm. uh, to some extent, you know, the journey's still going, but I actually proved them wrong. And it was so, yeah. um, I don't know, euphoric for me. So for her to do the mm. same thing, I think she has challenges like that as well, where she feels uh, really empowered if she was able to do what people said she couldn't, but in the in the dress and the, the you know, the symbols that mm. we hold. Um, mm. I do feel, I don't know, how, how, would you consider it weakness for people who, who, maybe get rid of those symbols as soon as the going gets tough i mean i'm I'm thinking about it but and i'm gonna say you know most of the time yes most of the time because uh, like just because you said as soon as the going gets tough you know because yeah yeah you know allah allah tests us isn't it and so it's like if your life is all cushy and everything's absolutely comfortable um then it's like you need to prove isn't it you need to prove yeah. it's yeah. like the how many times in the quran mentions the munafiqun the honestly the opposite of of nifaq in, in the quran as far as i always read it's always opposed to nifaq is fighting the cause of allah right mm. and so allah's like okay this is iman and uh th- th- this is iman and these guys didn't want to fight or like these guys didn't want to fight, and these guys are true believers. It's always opposite. Yeah. So, um, what is what is fighting? I mean, it's it's the way to uh, prove that you're you're really down to ride, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. So it's like if you have true iman, then you need some some strength when the test comes, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, basically. I suppose and we we I suppose my advice to anyone is to weigh up the the positives and negatives to weigh up. Like the maslaha and the yeah, yeah, of yeah. whatever you're going into, because if yeah. it is, that, that's a, what I wanted to say, bro. Is that you know, uh, I'll give I'll give the example that Mufti always brings, which is which is a really good one. That's why I'm rep- or, or, you know repeating it. Hmm. He says, for example, yeah, you know, Mufti used to be a barber. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Go um, on. I, I know this yeah. example, but the listeners yeah, should yeah, hear yeah. it. Yeah, th- this is this is very, bro. This is like so real life. You know, um, hmm. so he he talks about. Um, barber shops, especially in the U.S., especially in certain areas, I think um, the, there's the whole um, culture of barber shops, music blaring, who knows what on the TV, um, yeah. gossiping, backbiting, you know, that kind of culture in the barber shops, right? So it's like, okay, Muslims are going to these barber shops. They're they're being kind of forced to go to the barber shops, right? Where there's this going on. So what if now a Muslim wants to open a barber shop? 
well, uh, I don't know if it's le a legal requirement or not, but he's like, he needs to get licensed. He needs to be a licensed barber or whatever, right? I guess maybe it's for hygiene reasons, yeah? Yeah. Um, so it means you have to go through a process of getting the license, which requires you to learn to shave a man's beard and to like yeah. uh, thread a woman's eyebrows or whatever, yeah? So yeah. you have to do these things which, which are haram. But he said, perhaps, obviously he never gives like the final thing, because I suppose it comes down to what you're comfortable with and stuff. Perhaps because you went through those, those haram things, you got the license, now you open your barbershop, now you are um, able to serve the Muslims in a better environment where they don't have to, they're not being forced to go and listen to music and see whatever it is on the TV and hear gossip every, like once a week or once every two weeks when they get their hair cut. Yeah. Uh, and so it's like, he really, he said that in a really good way, man. Like sometimes, you know, it's true, bro. It's true. Sometimes a small sin is maybe necessary for a bigger, greater good. But the, the difficulty is, and I really, really struggle with this. The difficulty is, how do you define, like, it's just so hard to say to yourself, this sin is fine. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. a, a rule I try and have with myself is, um, you're going to sin, but never plan to sin. Mm, yeah like if you it. sin do it do it freestyle <laughs> yeah um and so like the distinction is the distinction yeah. there is that um a lot of people talk about the, the the sin being something from desire so it could be like you know in in that example mufti isn't talking about that the individual desires that sin in a sense that it's giving him pleasure to i don't mm. know, shave a man's beard right mm. um but the, the that sounds kind of weird, bro. <laughs> Having I know, but this is it. So there's people that use that to say, I don't know. Let's say that we were talking about earlier, like you want a specific job, right? You desire that job, not because yeah. there is actually a great benefit that extends beyond yourself, right? Mm. Uh, and that's something that you can bring back to the ummah. Um, mm. No, it's simply just yourself, you know. Um, mm. So you desire to find leeway to get into that, right? Mm. Um, but here it's like, well, actually, my end goal is to be able to have my own thing where I don't have to do this anymore. Right? I don't have mm. to do. I don't have to work through these things anymore. I think he gave another example regards to um, was it cooking? Like a, in a cooking school, becoming a professional chef. He said, well, you're going to have to learn how to cook X, Y, Z. You know, thing that might not be permissible to eat or whatever. Mm. Um, and like you said, he's not definitively saying, oh no, yeah, listen to me and go and do it. But he's yeah. just putting that thought process in your mind yeah yeah um which is really quite valuable i think yeah well man it's really difficult man because i just I, I feel like there might be benefit in doing some of these small sins for a greater thing but i really just can't bring myself to to go ahead with it man so I know, I know. What, what, what does that mean like does it mean that um we kind of rely on maybe some people with weaker iman or like what is it man i, I don't know you know what that's m most <laughs> what you've just said there i think that's one of the, the key things we rely on people with weaker iman we definitely definitely do and it's something i thought about for a long time think about even okay let's i know it's it's quite controversial but even um look at businesses that are owned by muslims right mm. uh, i'm talking about physical businesses with actual property mm. um you know, etc. Mm. They're all, you know, they all have to be insured in a certain type of way. Yeah. You know, the actual owning of that biz of that business had to be done for a mortgage or whatever. Yeah. You know, all of these institutions. But we were talking earlier about East London, right? And all the separate businesses that are set up and the facilities available for Muslims and stuff. Mm. But, but do you think that all of those businesses and stuff, well, Allahu Alam, but all of those businesses and institutions were set up solely, completely Sharia compliant you mm. know it, the reality of the world is mm. everything bro has the dust of mm. of that on it everything mm. has the dust of impurity yeah. on it yeah. um so where what do we do do we remain stagnant uh you know i'm not saying that the sharia has no place here but i'm saying that maybe one day we can get to a point where the sharia sh sharia has um we have the power to implement it how we want to in implement it you know <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, without the education Without know mm. the know how, without mm. the experience from how this this society works, how do we implement that up there? Mm. You know, yeah, it, it reminds me a lot of um, the revolutions that happened in North Africa. So, mm. a story that my, my I think my father told me was that um, 
when uh, everything was sort of outsourced to the French, right? So the French were the ones that teaching, the French were the ones that sort of running industry and that. Um, they obviously got kicked out or they left. Allahu alam. Whatever side you want to pick, <laughs> at least in Tunisia, they left. Bro, the Algerians and... kicked them out of Tunisia. Oh, the Algerians kicked there them out go. in no, Tunisia. No. We, took, we kicked them out of Tunisia as well, bro. <laughs> Allah, Adam. Listen, Maybe we scared so, them away. What? So, so when they left, there was all these black holes, essentially these voids of yes, positions yeah. that needed to be filled. Yeah, but no one had qualifications. So mm. I asked, like, who? How did teachers? become teachers like mm. they weren't qualified to mm. and apparently it was literally just anybody who could read like anybody mm. who could who had a decent reading level mm. he would not have known the subject or been an expert or whatever but he had to fill that gap right mm. and you had this very long period of catch-up because we had no one of knowledge in these air er- in these secular areas even islamically bro think about mm. it even islamically why is there such a void why was it when <laughs> when tunisians had free reign they just mm. protested and pillaged and then extremism really grew out of Tunisia. It's mm. because they had this such a long void of people that had no knowledge, mm. right, of the religion. Whilst think about it this way, hypothetically speaking, mm. if you had somebody who knew, you know, some amount of knowledge, okay, and was authorized, let's say, by the government, authorized mm. by the government, whatever mm. oppressive government it was, authorized by the government to teach whatever aspects of islam they the government felt comfortable with right mm. at least at least there's someone with like a a bit of knowledge on certain issues that could have then opened up more and learned more in it and, mm. and and delved into it more but when nobody bothered when no one bothered because it's too haram or it's too controversial whatever then when that mm. relief does come everybody's mm. a you know a blind leading the blind mm. you know mm. yeah, yeah this is the thing is like we see it, bro. We see it now, and I'm sure it, it was. We well, you know about it happening 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Is like whenever someone takes that controversial stance, everybody goes goes in on them, basically. Mm. But you know, I, sometimes I just feel like in the long scheme of things, like wallah, you don't know. You don't know if how Allah will judge them for that. You know. Mm. Another example, I was thinking about. Just last week, because I was uh, I was doing some kind of research and stuff, yeah, um, and I came across a, you know, let's call it the Arab Buzzfeed, okay? Yeah. Um, this is a company, media company. They um, they're pretty well funded. You know, they've got investors. I'm sure they're you know they're not making a profit yet. You know, they're probably like five years old or something. And I'm scrolling through their website, right? They they put out articles, and I'm sure they do social media content as well, yeah. I'm scrolling through the articles, bro, and the the angle they take on absolutely everything is a liberal, almost mm. anti-Islamic stance. Okay, yeah. and this is uh, potentially is the leading new media company in the Arab world. Yeah. Okay, and it's like I, I was just thinking about this is terrible. Like, how is this happening? Um, yeah. um, it, it's crazy, right? But then I was thinking. If I wanted, if me as someone trying to obey Allah, yeah, if I wanted to compete with them, right, compete for people's attention, people's eyeballs, yeah, how am I going to do that without, for example, bro, a very, maybe you could call it a basic thing is to have pictures of women in your articles because it might be right. relevant to the story, right? Yeah. But obviously for me, that's a very difficult thing to do. But if I want to compete with them, especially the way the way people are now is they don't even find they will think you're crazy for for hesitating to do that right hmm. but but this is the thing how how will i compete with them when i'm not willing to go toe to toe in that sense right yeah. um it's very difficult man and I, I, honestly I, I don't know if i can do something like that anytime soon and yeah but a good a good point that you made is about what what you're desiring when you're doing it you know, because in a malamalu bin niyat, right? Like, maybe it's always a maybe. You don't know because it's not something clear cut in the Sharia where it's like, um, if if there's a, well, there is the principle of greater good and stuff, mm. but it's like it's it's very nuanced. It's hard to clear cut say, okay, 
yes yes definitely 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 if you make this media company even if you do some music here and there you do some women here and there but it, the, the, your intention is to compete with them and to get mm. a general islamic angle out there um then definitely you won't you won't get the sin for that like nobody can guarantee you isn't it yeah exactly no one no one that's can. what's scary man yeah and it's it's, it's it's uncomfortable unless you've got that go ahead mm. like even now bro like in my you know in my career i'm just still very anxious sometimes it just builds upon me mm. um that am i doing the right thing being here is it something that there is benefit in and you know you know my day to day i do see benefits sometimes i do see benefits that are directly uh there for muslims right mm. um but then i just think of myself and what is it you know it's it's about it's almost like you're sacrificing yourself for the the greater good of mm. you know, the the muslim ummah yeah um but uh, you know once again allahu alam you just do not know you know you just do not know um it's hard isn't it the more yeah. you think about it the more it's, it just becomes so challenging yeah um yeah but what can we do like yeah. i do i have a <laughs> I, I think our um experiences of like the muslim world anyway are maybe a bit more different i think you, a lot of alam is an assumption but i think you've been you've sat more with practice in circles right and that may be your your view is a little bit more islamic of the muslim world whilst i don't i have never really had many practicing muslims in my circle when i go to whether it's morocco or tunisia or wherever so mm. my view of the islamic world is that it's not very islamic anymore Mm. you know um mm. so i've always had it in my mind that the revival of islam in those countries will come from the ones that aren't there because here i see a lot more practicing muslims than i do over there mm. right but that's just my goggles mm. right maybe you're biased the other direction but it right. depends bro it depends how you see it because the way i see the arab world is that on the surface they're not practicing you know yeah. i'm making a huge massive generalization here yeah but let's say on the surface people are not really thinking uh looking at life through islamic goggles let's say yeah yeah um you can say that that pretty much for sure okay um uh, definitely there's definitely plenty of good there's plenty of people praying plenty of people make making dua and this and that right hmm. but for me um when I, i see through the shaven face and the whatever clothes that are imitating bad people and this and that when i see through that and i look a little bit deeper i feel yeah just from these little things that come out of people's mouths that they have a a deep deep down they they're attached to islam right right and that's why i feel like uh, although the, on the surface they 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 kind of have a superficial maybe practice of islam but deep down sometimes i feel like their iman is is def- is stronger than um other people right yeah. and i feel like this is this is a powerful point that i've realized over the i don't know last six months is that it throughout history people follow the culture and they follow what is in okay so if islam is in i promise you people will be practicing islam and so it's not it's not always about individually converting people to become more practicing right it's not about that sometimes you just have to make islam the cool thing or make islam the dominant thing and people yeah. will people just sway bro people sway with the, like the wind man and so you need to make the wind in the favor of islam a, a, a good example is when um in egypt right when sisi came into power the media atmosphere became very um non-islamic almost anti-islam right and people swayed in that direction very easily and quickly okay and yeah. this is this is what, what i've been told by egyptian people yeah they 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 swayed very quickly in that direction but equally it means equally they can sway in the other direction but i would argue they can sway even easier in the islamic direction because they have that base foundation of iman mm. honestly bro i feel like they love allah they love his messenger yeah they just mm. maybe they lack education there's pressures there's you know all these different things so I'm quite optimistic. I feel like there's plenty of people out there who can lead a revival themselves, but um you know, getting momentum and even knowing how to go about that is yeah. very difficult. Yeah. Very I difficult. think um what what I've noticed at least is there is a there has been a strong revival in seeking knowledge. Um and I always say that based on the past I don't know, five, six years. Um 
I don't know if it's just a personal observation, um, but I remember when I started practicing, it was very uh, the content that was out there was very what's the word? I don't know. Uh, short-lived, um, immediate gratification sort of boost amen, you know, boost your amen sort of thing, mm. and then there was this discourse coming about actually seeking knowledge properly you know mm. going to classes um you know going maybe even abroad to study etc and i think that has become a bit more accessible i think a lot of that was locked away because people didn't know how to go about it uh, mm. there was less communication with regards to you know if one did have that interest how do they do it and now there's actually content out there step by step you know this is the process and there's even people now like students of knowledge maybe in medina or mauritania or whatever um that have sort of documented their experience almost like a vlog style like okay this is what happens this is the way we sleep this is where and i think that's opened up the doors to actually mm. um, a bit more transparency into how that stuff works i remember growing up thinking that those people that go abroad to study are like um I don't know. It was just like a mystery, almost. It was almost like a like a, a quest that people go on. Yeah, that it just it seems really far fetched for me and my reality. Mm. Um, but seeing people my age doing it and people younger than me doing it, um, mm. it's really really inspiring, and, and it really shows that actually these people are serious. You know, mm. um, they're not um, they're actually doing something, right? Mm. Mm. Uh, but it, it and it, and it showed to me actually that the. The culture is still very much alive. Um, there are countries that are still very much supportive and and encouraging. I'm talking about the general masses, like encouraging of you know people coming to study. Like Mauritania is one of them. Like people go over there, bro. It's Quran, Quran, Quran. Like the yeah. students of knowledge are all over the place. Um, st- same with Egypt. Funnily enough, like there's pockets of Egypt that I I see in here that are all like students of knowledge are everywhere, all over the place. Um, Morocco as well in terms of uh, Quran memorization and stuff so I think the, the fundamental knowledge like you said it is there um, I think it, maybe we just live in a time and I don't know how long this time is going to go on for or if it's been going on since before we were born I don't know but we live in a time that is severely tainted with this sort of discourse regarding extremism and uh, you know Islamophobia and, and you know terrorism and stuff like that I think that is that is one of our biggest battles and hindrances and I think going back to what we said earlier about the banning of the niqab in certain countries and stuff I think it's interesting to see how we're going to start challenging that when we step forward you know it was it was for 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 me when a non-muslim would say it it didn't really bother me you know it still doesn't bother me I don't feel like they're hindering me by having their opinion um but when it's put in practice and it's affecting our own you know populations then that's when it's like, oh, you know, when it's actually practically starting to become a barrier, you know? Oh, okay. Um, sounds like a tweet just lost his internet connection. Strange. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up anyway at some point. I hope he... Hmm, he's not coming back. But anyway... Uh, yeah, subhanAllah, lots lots of good stuff covered in this episode. It's been episode 43, we didn't say that at the beginning. Episode 43 of the Mind Heist podcast. Hope you enjoyed this, honestly, very interesting, very deep conversation. You know, I, I, we had another complete topic to cover. Um, I actually had the, the topic in mind. I had bullet points um, that I wanted to um, go through. But this this has just been it's just sucked us in this topic whatever whatever the topic is, um, I, I I can't really summarize what the topic was about. It kind of uh, sucked us in. So Alhamdulillah, I think we kind of we touched on stuff we never touched on before as well. Um, our thoughts on certain things and uh, how to navigate that. Um, I'm just seeing that Ahi tweets actually back online now, um, but I think we will be wrapping it up anyway. Subhanallah. Okay, he's calling me. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Are you still recording, bro? Yeah, salam alaikum. I can hear you. Oh. Ah, oh, subhanallah. I will 
wrap up the podcast. Okay. Okay, he says it's it stopped recording. Okay, guys, I guess we'll wrap it up there. Very good episode. Um, yeah, uh, share your thoughts, share any questions you have uh, on either by email, which is mindheistpodcast.gmail.com or um, curiouscat, uh, curiouscat.me slash mindheistpod, inshallah. We've also got Instagram, mindheistpod. Um, just uh, let us know your thoughts there. It'll be very good to bounce back and forth with with some of the listeners. Jazakumullah khairan for listening. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha la anta. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.